Wake up, babe. The latest strand type game just dropped. Spoilers ahead for the worst story ever told. But like, you're an adult. Let's not do this. Also, I'm right about everything in this video. And if you disagree at any point, please close the video as a sign of mutual respect. This script is 13 pages long. So will everyone please get their weans out and turn to page one? We open with the story so far. In Destiny 1, you know how everything in the world is kind of ruined and stinky? That's because of the collapse TM. But why collapsing? Bad engineer? No, it was this thing. The witness. Or as I like to call it, the brow. However, broken glass is in inherently cool, and thank you for doing that. My brain lackey. Anyway, we thought the brow was the darkness, but it only uses the darkness. Big diff. It's Leviosa. You stupid bitch. Remember this chick from the last expansion? We technically killed her, but then her ghost got away. Uh-oh. So you're probably wondering where she's at. Wrong. Don't even think about it, and we will not be addressing that. Remember the final boss from Destiny 2's first raid five years ago, Callus, aka the Rich Thumb? This is him heading into surgery, about to be empowered by the most giga baddie this franchise has ever seen. After five years, I can't wait to see how his story ends, and I'm sure it will be cool and big. The great egg that's been sitting in our lap since Destiny 1 has moved slightly upwards. Everyone shut up. We're in space with the egg and it's time for a space battle directly in space with spaceships. These triangles are actually Emperor Palpatine's ships from Rise of Skywalker. They freelance on weekends. This is office window shot number one from the guy in charge of everything. <laughs> it's pretty high octane. He seems very invested in how these events play out and will definitely leave that room at least one time. By pointing one finger, the witness kills exactly five of our ships and five was enough to piss off the traveler. It uses hyper beam, except the beam is made of dreams and shrubs and sparkles, which is very pretty, but has no effect on the witness whatsoever. Bit of a bummer really, but everyone knows normal type moves have no effect on ghost type Pokemon. The witness also appears to possess the reality stone from Infinity War, which is surprising considering Marvel's recent decline at the box office. Then Captain Marvel crashes straight into this thing. Amanda! But she lived, thank God. I'm sure nothing else bad will happen to her this season. The witness puts a muzzle on the trav, no problem. Everything turns red to show us that's bad. Please try and keep up, you brainless little goblin. Upon touching our trav, the brow has a vision of planet Neptune, and so begins mission number one. So we climb aboard Callus's ship, which is headed for Nepaduski. Nepotism. Nep World Park. But why go to? Let's hear it from the cranky old man who knows everything, but only when it's convenient to the story, Osiris. Callus is after an artifact on Neptune, the veil. In the opening dialogue of mission one, we hear two very mysterious, but supremely important words. The Veil. Every good mystery starts with a single loose thread. I can't wait to unravel this masterpiece. I try to hitch a ride like the previous cutscene. I've done it once, I can do it again. Osiris decides we're at a theme park and it's his turn on the big boy ride. Hurry up. Those things say can't be. Yeah, so the story was actually all downhill from this moment and choked me with a hot dog. I was not expecting that at the time. I would also like to ride the undisputed king of most guardian kills in Destiny, the car ball. There are sounds happening. The console wiggles a bit. Everything fades to black and when we fade back in, we're standing at the place we went. I'm no Disney Imagineer, but the best part of any roller coaster is usually right between getting on and getting off the ride. We couldn't have gone 3P of the light speed crash land for old time's sake, dude. That's third person, sorry for the abrief. I thought I accidentally skipped a cutscene. There was so little transition between these spaces. I was spamming escape, checking my friend's streams, like, well, hang on, what, just, what did they see? What was their point of view? Oh, it was just a fade to Shut up and welcome to Night City, a neon-soaked metropolis run by dystopian megacorps like Arasaka. Psych, that's cyberpunk, and this is Destiny you effing moron. They're very different. Do you even play games? We touch the mysterious sexy web for the first time and get a nice little Death Stranding tutorial. This is only the first mission, so that makes sense. I can't wait to use the subclass fully now that we've gotten the learning out of the way. Now we meet the coked up rookie and the grizzled my wife hasn't had sex with me in years mentor. Bleh. Nimbus and Rohan. The former keeps pushing Cabal with a surfboard like that's legitimate DPS and the latter kills a tormentor in one shot by blowing up a few barrels. We were playing on legend difficulty and that's an unreasonable amount of canister damage. Rohan lets Osiris out of his cage, and if it isn't six foot versus 5'11", a visual novel. Osiris reminds us that everyone's only objective should be to get to the veil immediately, but he doesn't elaborate. So how important is it really? And then Rohan says this. Not all of us have lives to spare. Rohan doesn't have a ghost that can resurrect him. When he dies, he's died. Except Osiris is one of the only guardians whose ghost also died. Resurrection mutually unavailable? And in conclusion, I have Ligma. Cloud Striders look like the cyberware from Cyberpunk was made by Pixar. Or like the Silver Surfer ran out of VFX budget halfway through production. Or like the Gambit Chrome shader bugged out on a tall human and they just went with it. I could keep going, but I respect you too much. Callus emerges from his bathtub surgery pod with the classic dip my right foot in gold only look. It's a rich person thing. Also a KFC chicken bucket hat and some exhaust pipes on his shoulders. This is what partnering with the most superior being in the universe gets you. A new outfit.
and a new cup. The witness appears through a broken window of reality to ask if Callus has the veil yet. Apparently the veil is the next step to the final shape. Please buy our next expansion also. It's supposed to be the dramatic conclusion to the light and darkness saga. So when the witness says the veil is the step before final shape, that seems kind of important. I can't wait to understand. Technically all these two colossal baddies did was stand in a room chatting, but I'm sure they'll do other stuff that's different from that also. Back at the neon tower, Nimbus says this. And here you come, zipping around, smacking bad guys with green strings. Stuff. I mean, anyways, enough about you. Now at this point, alarm bells are going off in my head. That style of dialogue is feeling kind of childish and is trying kind of hard, but Finch said some cringe stuff here and there back in Witch Queen. And overall, I didn't mind him too much, so maybe it'll be like that. Apparently Nimbus is a cloud strider, one of two security guards defending Neo Muna. That's the city all around us. I said that earlier, but as we all know, a Google Doc is unchangeable. Now why are there only two cloud striders for an entire city? That ratio feels very specific. I'm sure they'll explain it soon. Then Nimbus says this about the the veil. I'd do pretty much anything to keep the veil and the people of Neo Muna safe. So the veil is as important as the safety of every person in the city. Let's add Nimbus to the list of people who seem to know what the veil is while refusing to elaborate. I doubt this will grow over time. By the way, this one MacGuffin is the most important out of all the things. Okay, can you say what it is or why it matters? There's no time. Stop being selfish and evil, like Hitler. Instead, we get this line. You know the veil's in danger. I know where those big guys are headed. Let's go do some hero stuff. As someone who's made a career out of trying desperately to be funny, this this dialogue is trying desperately to be funny. And usually I wouldn't have a problem with that. Except the tone of the cutscene moments before this was our universe is on fire and the two capital B baddies of the franchise are moments from doing the thing, the bad thing. So Nimbus's one-liners being fired off like it's an open mic at a comedy club are feeling as misplaced as my faith in Bungie to tell a coherent story post Witch Queen. Back to Osiris who tells us this about Callus. His pursuit of this object, the veil, is of dire importance. If he gets to it first, urgency is key. The old dot dot dot. Finally, someone gives us a decent explanation. Three dots in a row tells me all the things. No further questions, Your Honor. Let's go to recess and touch ourselves. In the meantime, why don't we add Osiris to the list of people who seem to know what the veil is while refusing to elaborate. Then we hear this on a radio broadcast. All citizens are promoted to active defense duties effective immediately. Now, the only problem with that is all citizens currently look like this. Yeah, those extremely transparent, vaguely humanoid glowy spots. That's because when Callus attacked, everyone fled to the the cloud, like the iCloud cloud, the everyone signed up for Dropbox like their life depended on it cloud. You know I could go on. The people's physical bodies are all in cryopods, so unless this is the prologue to Fallout 4, they ain't coming to help. Someone should tell the radio guy that only the two cloud striders and a handful of guardians showed up to defend the universe. I'd be surprised if we lost this one, but place your bets accordingly. Nimbus tells us we're very close to the veil now, and Ghost says the closer we get, the more he doesn't feel so good, Mr. Stark. I doubt we need to pay attention to that though, I mean, what could possibly go wrong? <sighs> So the witness possessed our ghost to FaceTime Callus. He doesn't acknowledge that we're standing right there, so I don't know if he can see us or... Callus does say this about the veil though. We have captured the veil. Well, the area around the veil. The witness tells Callus to link the radial mast and destroy the veil. What's the radial mast, question mark? Why, it's only the new MacGuffin for the next four missions. Or more specifically, a USB cable, type V to T, because it's supposed to link the veil to the trav. For some reason, if the veil gets plugged into the trav, that's bad. So let's add Callus and the witness to the list of people who know what the veil is. Back at HQ, we get a few somber sentences from Nimbus, disclosing that if Callus uses the radial MacGuff to blow the veil, not in a fun way, then all Neomunians will die because their Google Drive is also tied directly to the veil. We are closing in on a tangible definition for the big V, I can feel it. Nimbus finally adds that we don't need any explanation as to why that's bad. I don't think you need a warlord translation for why that's bad. Every time someone mentions the dire stakes regarding the veil, there's also a hand wave and a wink, like we're all on the same page. And we are, thank you for not wasting my time. But just when you thought Nimbus was appropriately respecting a tense story beat. It's okay if we lean back and try a little trust fall. Well, if you drop us, it might be my funeral, but whatever, it'll be fun. It's back to quirky, silly, I'm the best ever dialogue like Cade 6. But if he was never funny, I never liked by anyone. So we're off to Callus's ship to destroy the Radial. Along the way, Rohan asks some great questions. There's still a great deal we don't know. What is the Radial Mass capable of? How will it affect the Veil? And what is the witness planning? Osiris rightly hand waves any possible explanation due to 
urgency. This is annoying and makes my PP shrink. Because from near Moon of Cutscene number one, we've been pressured onward relentlessly without any satisfying context. Also notice that Rohan doesn't ask what the veil is. That's because he already knows. He's going on the list. We find the radial USB, but uh oh, it was a trap set by Callus. He welcomes us to this final test of strength. Osiris tells us to ignore his effing bloviating, which is an 11 out of 10 choice of words. Credit where credit is belong. We kill all the things and get another strand tutorial for 76 seconds. Callus summons an immune boss and that is my least favorite type of shield. It looks like this is the end for us. Is what I would have said if Caitlyn, Callus's hot single daughter, didn't swoop in out of nowhere and save us. She somehow lowers the barrier that was previously impenetrable, probably with the power of daughterhood and sex. We sparrow to safety. We get an expository cutscene where Caitlyn describes her father. I think this is Daddy Cal stealing food from his baby girl. Callus used to be the Cabal Emperor, or super important super guy, until he was overthrown by Gaul. You remember him from the vanilla Destiny 2 campaign like five years ago? If you missed that, they've since deleted it from the game, so just take my word for it, I guess. There's Daddy Cal partnering with the Witness again, and I still can't wait to see what sicko mode power he's acquired. I haven't really talked about Osiris as a character yet, but just vibing his demeanor. He's very panicked and cranky, but only all of the time. And those are certainly valid emotions to feel because your ghost is dead. But also stop it because it's kind of a bummer. I did hear this one interaction that I really liked from him though. So at one point Nimbus says this. You know, when I first got the full set of mods, I was making friends with the ground every five minutes. It takes a second to find your balance sometimes. And Osiris says. So it does. I Appreciate the reminder. That was a certified gamer moment of sincere connection, delivered with a side of convincing emotion by Osiris's voice actor. Give us warm grandpa who appreciates every moment now that he can't resurrect anymore. Instead of grumpy old troglodyte fumbling his saggy balls loser that no one- I know that that was too harsh, but I really got carried away with the insult and my backspace key is on leave, so I, I couldn't change it. This ungodly wall of text explains that the Cloud Ark, the Google Drive containing every Neo citizen, is infrastructure built on the Veil's power. If you want answers around here, you need a master's degree in paying attention. Luckily, nothing gets past this laser focus. Nimbus says we should do this with the server. If we can cycle the power, a hard reset like that should kick things back into gear. We're literally turning it off and on again. Troubleshooting is similar in the future. We start mission four and out of nowhere, the ghost does something I actually thought was forbidden. He asks for an explanation. Rohan, I think we're still a little fuzzy here. What exactly is the cloud art? So we could just ask this whole time if we wanted more information. I have multiple asking to have. Also, this is the first thing the ghost has needed clarification on this whole campaign. He's going on the list. How else do you explain such an abysmal lack of curiosity? Rohan then says this about the cloud arc. It's our city's network, our infrastructure, our people, our defenses. Everything depends on it. Yeah, that's too many things in one thing. How about we diversify some of the stuff out of that risky bundle? Anyway, wouldn't you know it, the Vex are currently stealing energy from that everything in one thing cloud reactor. The Vex have been around doing stuff this whole time, but it wasn't really worth mentioning up until now. The Vex are like ants, always up to something, but unless they're eroding the foundation of my house, I don't need to hear about it. We get another strand tutorial for literally one jump, cock and ball torture. We kill a bunch of Vex and reboot the reactor. But uh-oh, Yugi, you fool. It was a trap, and now we're running from the Shadow Realm Legion. We get Strand for another 16 seconds. That's not a joke, by the way. I time the footage every Strand tutorial. I am that petty, and I've been that petty. We kill a bunch of Shadow Boys and use Strand for another 53 seconds to escape the building before Big Splo- Back at the tower, Osiris is fondling his sugar balls and goes into a rant about the light and darkness, saying we thought we were the good guys because we wielded the light, but actually light and dark aren't even moral or opposite because the Traveler is a gardener. Therefore, the light is the domain of the physical, like forehead kisses, and the darkness is the domain of my butthole. No, the psychological. For example, dreams, nightmares, emotions, pain, memory. Nimbus interrupts to say something about a river from an old nursery rhyme, and the conclusion is, we are that river. But mentioning the river causes Osiris' arm to get very excited. A nursery rhyme being a major breakthrough is fitting for this level of story. So obviously I have no qualifications as a writer and I dropped out of high school, but here's why Nimbus words are bad actually. It was this little pseudo cutscene monologue that forced me to articulate what I thought was the problem TM. So based on the way the subtitles are grouped, there's 10 lines of dialogue here. Am I a bad person for caring about this throwaway tower speech? Yes. Am I probably wrong on all accounts? Yes. Am I unqualified? 
yes. But am I going to justify every criticism like my life depends on it? Also, yes. Let's get toxic and arrogant. I talked with Osiris. You know, he gives off uptight museum volunteer vibes, but he's a nice guy when you catch him one-on-one. -on -one. This was a decent roast attempt, but the writers didn't commit enough to make it good. They soften the blow on either side, which waters it down too much, IMO. Instead of saying, you know, he gives off XYZ vibes. It should have been, yes, he's an uptight museum volunteer, but he's pretty nice one-on-one. -on -one. Just by changing a few little words, that roast goes from weak Zoomer energy to getting obliterated live on television. He got me thinking, which is a compliment I can give very few people. Then we've already had a good joke, so we can cut line two. I know a place for your strand can stay as line three. Speaking of compliments, you, you never fail to amaze me. You know that? Everything that's come at us, you're just like, bam, boom, and suddenly whatever's coming at us ain't coming at us anymore. And we just keep doing it like it's nothing. Lines four, five, and six are all super heavy, cringe pandering that's so overdone it loses all meaning. Just a simple, hey, it's been great since you got here. Love having you on the team. Would've been fine. The first time Rohan told me I did a good job, I'd given up hoping for it. And by the time I got it, I didn't need it. In hindsight, I think he did that on purpose, but whatever. I promised myself I'd do it different when I took over. Nimbus shows us there is some maturity in there with lines seven and eight, and not just a bunch of flippant childish hubris that addresses everyone like they're 15 years old. So we've condensed four, five, and six into one line that's actually meaningful and not cringe. Line seven is really solid. That's an adult speaking. Yay for adults talking. Line eight is the first real telegraph to me that Nimbus might be the head cloud strider soon. And if you just ended the monologue there, I would be pondering that exact thing in the moment. But instead they wrote something about head, shoulders, his knees and toes. The old man might think compliments go straight to your head, but if that helps you strandify and us take down Callus, by all means, let it go to your head, shoulders, knees, and toes. I mean, is this an episode of Peppa Pig? Let's just have Dora the Explorer voice the rest of this campaign, so at least it'll make sense tonally. What the F is going on here? So, in hindsight, we only needed five out of those ten lines. I think efficiency really matters in writing, and when you're under-explaining the story whilst over-emphasizing jokes and it's not a comedy, that just feels frustrating and abrasive. And if the jokes aren't landing on top of all that, it's just a train wreck in motion, and how did this even get made? Unfortunately, I feel like most of these critiques could probably also apply to a lot of the campaign dialogue just overall. Wrong tone, inefficient, unfunny. Which I'll agree could be said of most of my videos. So we're off to get to the bottom of Strand, and not its OnlyFans curvy bottom sex appeal bottom. It's origin bottom. And this time we actually get almost four full minutes before it's ripped away. So we're over halfway through the campaign and we still can't handle more than a few minutes at a time with the main selling point of the expansion. The constant yo-yoing is starting to feel like my body weight as a long-term gamer. The justification for why they keep yanking it back off us isn't great either. Ghost is saying we need a breather. Osiris is saying stop being a little bitch. Except we aren't backing away, are we? It's being forcibly removed. So that dialogue rings very hollow. Like Bungie's Vidoc, when they said you will feel like the tip of the spear. Does this look like the tip of the spear? Or does it look like my poopies burned my butt? Me ouchie. We kind of get Strand back for the rest of the mission whilst constantly taking micro breaks for reasons, blah, blah, blah. Final boss down and the mission that was all about Strand doesn't unlock it. But ends with Osiris saying, we're still missing something and that he needs more time. I'm about to turn 30, Osiris. But unfortunately, time comes for us all. Get it together, you effing guy. So if the whole thing is that nobody has Strand yet and we as Guardians are discovering it like the darkness archaeologists we are, how come Strand shield on big guy? Why bad boy have Strand? So we cut to him doing a big thinky think at the Puka Pond. Sagira, could you run some scans? Oh. Right. Yeah, Sagira's dead, my guy. These little space fishies are my only reason for existing now. And if I can't have one as a ghost shell, my destiny journey ends here. And then Rohan says something that tilts me. And we're back to the writing. But stay with me. I know it's arrogant to criticize a team of professional writers having written nothing of value myself. But also, I'm right about this. Okay, here's the line. I know I haven't been the easiest guest in your city. Pain is not a hindrance. Simply reminds us we're still breathing. Still fighting. To me, if a piece of dialogue is too obvious, boring, confusing, or cringe, it's bad writing. And I'm not talking about the delivery itself here, just the words. So when Rohan says, pain is not a hindrance, it simply reminds us we're still breathing. Someone says, hey, Rohan should say something about pain, and he's a wise old mentor figure, so it should be profound. Something about pain actually being good, and that it reminds us we're still breathing. And someone else said, perfect. No one else make any additional suggests. There's no time we have to move on. So that's why I'm rating that dialogue obvious and boring out of 10. Maybe I can do better. So after thinking about it for 90 seconds, here's the line that I came up with. And if this line isn't better than the original, I'm wrong about everything and close this video immediately. So here's my replacement. What is pain? 
but the shadow of joy. Now, I think that's better, but I always think I'm right due to various childhood trauma and extremely high intellect. I just cannot accept that a team of professional writers couldn't think of anything more interesting than pain reminds us we're still breathing. The same can be said of other feelings. Love reminds us we're still breathing. So does laughter and anger and grief and Ebola. No, that's a different thing. So much of the narrative in this campaign just feels like the first draft that no one had time to iterate or improve in any way. So we're off to find the radial MacGuffin, but for real this time. On the way, we get not one, not two, but three micro strand tutorials totaling two minutes and 16 seconds like it's an end of year clearance sale. Then we reach a dead end and Rohan blasts through the wall with his big muscles and pointy board. But like, if he can just get through anything, why are we traversing this labyrinth of vents when he could have made a tunnel straight to the thing? The cosmic USB cable is attaching to the veil, so Rohan jumps aboard to stall it or unplug it. He doesn't seem very tech literate, so I do have my doubts about that. Then it crunches him like a AAA studio making a video game. Some generic boss battle DPS, we get Strand for another 41 seconds, but I'm too busy making gamer plays up in this bitch. Osiris says we can use Strand to destroy the radiator, but oopsie, our tummies hurt LMAO. We're tired, no helpy help. So Rohan sacrifices himself to destroy the thing and theoretically save us for now. Nimbus asks us to pick up his core. But if their entire population is uploading their consciousness to the cloud, then why can't Rohan's be recovered from his core? In fact, when we get back to the tower, Nimbus is gonna call it Rohan's quote unquote, drive. So what kind of ultra futuristic hard drive can't store human brain data? We're told Neomuna has like 10 times the technology humanity did during our golden age. You're telling me they don't know how to put a copy of someone's consciousness in the cloud? Will control C, control V in the future? Otherwise they're 50% less secure when one of the cyber boys goes down. It just feels like they have the technology to handle this problem, but it's too inconvenient to the plot. So it's glossed over. And maybe there are some good answers, but not here. But also we don't know Yi Rohan. He was in literally two cutscenes, and now he's dead. Like we're supposed to care. You gotta get me to feel anything before you try and make me feel something. Humans are very complex like that. So we're back to Callie and Witty talking in a room. The same room from earlier. I don't wanna get too far ahead of myself here, but this is Callus' final cutscene. The end of a five year journey. And all that happens is that similar to my dad, the witness calls him a pathetic useless failure and he bleeds out of his own face in excruciatingly high detail. We'll come back to Callus, but for now let's move on to another out of touch Nimbus monologue that pissed me off. The first half is making fun of Osiris for being obsessed with Strand, which is fine, except why are we even still talking about Strand when that should have been wrapped up by the end of the Strand mission at the latest. We're still talking about mastering Strand like it's this week's homework assignment. Meanwhile, the universe could end at any moment. Any perspective in chat. Then we end with this from Nimbus. I think Rohan would have agreed. And so do I. Not because he's dead. And I automatically agree with a dead guy. Although not like he's really in a position to argue. Am I right? The first half of the monologue was already so lighthearted and jovial that I'm drowning in the wannabe Marvel tone. So to close with this from Nimbus when Rohan died basically two minutes earlier just doesn't make sense and feels so disrespectful. Are there any stakes in this story or not? Does Nimbus care about dead guy or not? Anything matter or no? Look, it's fine. I'm sure they adjust to a more appropriate tone in the next cutscene. Systems are late, with 80% of defenses now operational. I'm full of fury, she's got an army, and you got magic green strings. Let's crush this callous guy. Yeah, this story hates you for caring. If you believe there was any tension or stakes at all, you're dumb and stupid and hate children and have killed innocent people. Remember the screaming urgency of the first few missions? Well, what if we dove into a Kung Fu Panda, Master Shifu training Po, Rocky Balboa montage where we finally unlock Strand after all this time? No Strand have yet. Yeah, so I'm unclear on the timing and purpose of that spectacle other than we're getting closer to the sexy web question mark. Just to remind you, this is a very serious and legitimate campaign. Osiris says this. We have never never struggled harder against a greater evil. Thanks, Osiris. I couldn't agree more, and it almost didn't even need to be said. Anyway, this mission is another strange tutorial where we kill the guy and don't unlock it. Oh good, happy to be here. And now, for a dramatic recreation of my narrative expectation versus reality. We must stop Callus. So we're off to see the veil. That thing we all understand and know about. Oh, I see. They've set us up for a cool gameplay moment by putting the thresher here, and then we're gonna get to... Whoever put this thresher here is deeply unlovable and probably thinks the Star Wars sequel trilogy was a cinematic masterpiece, including the part where Leia is an ice wizard. We kill about a million guys and end up at the vault, which is the last thing protecting the veil. And it's still locked, so that's great. Nothing to worry about. And it's open. Callus appeared in his bulbous sky head form and just blew it wide open. So onward to the veil. I feel like a guy who's flown across the world to meet the hot chick he's been DMing online, praying she's real and not a guy named Jeremy. After eight hours of campaign, the ghost finally says this. That must be the veil. 
It's massive. At the risk of getting out of my depth, uh, it appears to be a psychedelic jellyfish-like substance. Interestingly, no one makes a single comment about the veil now that we are arrived. Not Osiris, not Nimbus. No one wants to elaborate on the Olympic-sized ayahuasca pool. Nothing in the Destiny universe has ever looked like this, and the characters that have been mouthing off all campaign have nothing to add. Well, touch me in my trauma spot. Anyway, it's final boss time, and is it just me, or does Callus look kind of goofy? The sassy turnaround and the bucket helmet. We're finally ready to see what it looks like to partner with the giga powerful universe being. But so far, it's a purple tracksuit and a new drill. Callus even says he's been waiting for this day a long time. He's done his waiting. 12 years of it in Azkaban. No, but this is the climactic final battle, and so far he's basically a colossus with a reskinned gun. Although once you drain his health, he activates phase two by ripping his gun in half with his chonky fingies. That's pretty neat. But his new attack is the bulky equivalent of a red bar gladiator slash. I get it, making game do big hard, but this moment was the end of a five year villain arc, except he doesn't feel like he changed at all the whole time. Narratively and in game, he didn't seem any more powerful than usual. He kinda goes out with a whimper, like the firework I put up my b-hole that time for science. I get that he's gluttonous and lazy, and so that's the point, Jez. He contributes nothing, and that's right in line with his character. But also be more interesting, you know what I mean? And he deserved better. It's his final word as he's dying that might be the only exception to everything I just said. Kameli. Who is that? Who is name said? Well, it turns out Bungie gave more nuance and depth to this character in his final word than the rest of this expansion combined. Kameli was probably his first wife and one true love. According to the Vanguard law book that came with the Lightfall Collector's Edition, that's right, this storytelling pissed me off so much that I dove into the law I've avoided for eight years and got my own effing answers. Let me set the scene. This is Keitel talking to her father right before the coup mentioned in the animated cutscene earlier, where Callus was overthrown as emperor. She's struggling internally, trying Trying to decide whether she wants to warn Callus about the upcoming betrayal. So she asks him one more time for answers about her mum. And he's never told her up until this point what happened to Kameli. From the book now. What of my mother? Didn't you want her back? Oh child. He looks into his wine, into his bone, and he begins to salivate with tears. She had to care for me when I was but a husk of a man. I was selfish. I was cold. I broke too much between us. And I cannot bear to hear him stumble any closer to grief. And she left. And then you found someone else. I quickly finish. Yes. Now, in that moment, she technically doesn't even believe her father. But why would she? He's heard her for too long by then. She's centuries old. Either way, this is the side of Callus I wish we could have seen. A husband and father who lives with the regret of losing his first love. Who carries the weight of past mistakes on his back. And who turned to gluttony to escape the pain. Struggling to be vulnerable and connect with his favorite daughter. Who is herself on a knife's edge between loyalty and betrayal to her father. I can see why people get into lore because that is an interesting story. Way more interesting than the gluttonous, power-hungry, selfish, one-dimensional bad guy portrayed in-game who hasn't changed in the five years we've known him. One is a deeply flawed family man, and the other is every generic bad guy ever. If only you dared to bring some shades of grey to his character. Maybe I'm conflicted to kill him, knowing deep down was the heart of an evil, but maybe also kind father and husband. Instead, we're just told he's an animal, he's evil, don't worry about it, don't feel anything. And so we don't, until his dying breath hints at a tragic story that will never be told, but was far more interesting. And just to get everyone excited and to agree, here's why Lord doesn't count for me when I'm evaluating a story. The campaign pain is the story you actually told, and the lore is the story you could've. The movie is the story the director actually told, and the interview where he clarifies some loose ends is the story he could've. The book is the story the author actually told, and their blog posts are the story they could have. I know you're mad, but stay with me. Can the extra tweets, blog posts, interviews, and knickknacks be interesting? Yes. Can they clarify? Yes. Can they tell stories? Yes. Can they gargle my balls? Also yes. All the extracurricular stuff in the world doesn't change the fact that you told the story you could at the time. And and that is the story I experienced. Now, obviously my case is airtight, but if you disagree, you're wrong. No, it's obviously fine. If Bungie explains nothing in the campaign and then releases a blog post or a new mission that fills in all the gaps, and for you that counts as a story well told, then I salute you and please pray for me. They are going to explain what the veil is in some form or another, but that won't fix the narrative failure of Lightfall for me. Back to the campaign. After we kill Callus, RIP Big Daddy, our ghost says this. Hey, uh, do you guys feel that. Warning us way ahead of time that something is wrong. So hopefully we're on high alert. Seeing as a few cutscenes ago, he was chatting with Supreme Bad Guy number two while possessed by Supreme Bad Guy number one. But let's see what happens. Caitlin arrives and has kind of a moment with her dead father saying, no more running away, rest now. There's a somber tone and rightfully so with the backstory I dug from the ancient texts. Thankfully Nimbus is actually respectful and doesn't ruin- The uglier they are, the harder they fall, right? 
poison me or at least paralyze me so I can escape the pain of being alive. That may have been the most tone-deaf line of dialogue ever delivered through this medium. The ghost takes off weirdly, speaking in a possessed voice. We stare blankly, even though we've already seen this. Osiris screams, get your ghost, and we stare blankly. The ghost says something and we stare blankly. Nimbus yells something, and we stare blankly. Back to ghost, we stare blankly. Then Kaidal yells, and we finally unfreeze. But instead of just grappling the ghost toward us with Strand, we pull out the Kvostov, an eight-year-old gun I haven't touched since my mother's womb. I had between three and 30 guns on me, depending on how full my inventory was, but instead, they went with that, probably for immersion. And that was a good call. A giant beam connects to the Trav, and Nimbus grabs the ghost at the speed of light, sparing us from pulling the trig. Why that couldn't have been done any earlier is also a mystery. Our ghost is fine, but then Kaidal says, we just lost. We page back to Zavala, who hasn't left what may as well be his office for the entirety of this world-ending event. The witness is also in the same spot we left it in that first cutscene. Like, no time has passed for this entire expansion. Almost like everything in between these two cutscenes was filler content and didn't matter at all. Anyway, the pyramid ships have made a sound emoji with a traveler. Maybe that's the final shape. Feels a bit lowbrow, so I hope I'm wrong on that. The witness draws what appears to be a triangular door colored like the veil, sends the ships in, and crosses maybe to the inside of our big egg. We fade to black with no actual explanation and all the blood is rushing to my tits. Other than Zavala saying this back at the tower, The Traveler, gone. Should I feel humbled by this sacrifice? Relieved that it can't grant any more of our enemies the light? I have so many questions. How do you know it's gone? How was that a sacrifice? How do you know it can't grant the light anymore? Why are you smiling if things are bad? Maybe Ikora will clear things up for us? The Traveler is gone. The Witness has transformed the Traveler and gone somewhere we cannot follow. How do you know it's gone? What transformation specifically? Why can't we follow it in there? Why are you doing a My Face is Tired Joker impression like this is Mass Effect Andromeda? Sorry, my face is tired from dealing with everything. Once again, the NPCs all seem to know what's happening while refusing to elaborate. They're like, well, you saw it, right? So we all know. Then Ikora gives us final instructions. Work with the Cloud Striders. Learn what you can about the veil. First of all, it's Cloud Strider. There's only one left. Pay attention. Other guy dying, kind of insensitive. And second of all, everyone else already knows what the veil is. So just ask literally anyone else. Much like me for the entirety of my teenage years, it feels like no one really moved or did anything. From start to end, the witness standing in one place. Bad guys talking, standing in one place. All the people in charge, standing in one place. Osiris lands and is standing in one place, though he gets a pass, obviously. All citizens glowing vaguely in one place. The only people that really get out there are Kaitel, Nimbus, and Rohan. Kaitel's my elephant mummy, so please step on me, Uwu. Rohan is dead, but also who even? And Nimbus should have died, but Bungie is punishing us all because we're toxic and ungrateful, probably. This was supposed to be the penultimate expansion before the final conclusion of the Light and Darkness saga, but instead we got an eight-hour strand tutorial and probably the worst Destiny story ever told. I get Bungie was going for an 80s action movie vibe, but just like those Power Rangers in Infinity War, we were destined to lose this one. That's what the penultimate chapter of a story is, and a hallmark of the 80s action genre is that the heroes ultimately prevail veil, not lose with no explanation. This was always a square peg and a round hole. And I know about holes because I have sex a lot and my wife doesn't watch these videos. The Taken King was Destiny 1's darling expansion. Released seven and a half years ago, it was critically acclaimed and introduced three new subclasses. And when specifically did we unlock those subclasses? In between the first and second mission, and they never took them back. Much like me and Genital Warts, we just had them. Lightfall is when Destiny 2 hit its highest concurrent players ever on Steam, and probably the other platforms also. Telling a bad story now is just such an effing bummer. How many new players have bounced off the game this expansion? Because shooting was fun, but what is going on even? Obviously, there was a lot of strong evidence that Strand was supposed to release with Witch Queen, but got cut for mysterious and totally ethical development reasons. Evidence including, but not limited to, Witch Queen Green, Strand Green. But hearing a director got changed three times throughout production doesn't take Take away the sting of a bad film. Narratively, it's okay to ask some questions and not give all answers. But if you're gonna make me eat vegetable, also feed me some actual food. Otherwise, I hate you. Lost, the TV series from my teenagehood, gave me lots of vegetables, but it also gave me candy. Candy is answers in this metaphor. And can dis dick fit? No, I'm kidding. At the end of the day, I'm tired. And this is a video game, and none of it matters. But also, I love art and wanted the thing I care about to be good. As an adult, feeling stuff can be hard, but the magic of great art is that the creator gets to transfer a feeling. That's the beauty of being human. We can make so others can feel. Except if your thing sucks, that's like putting diarrhea in a bowl. Avoid that if possible. If not, try again, because everyone makes diarrhea sometimes. Unless you're playing Scrabble, in which case, it's very rare to get all those letters at the same time. Very valuable though. What I'm trying to say is good art is really hard, and some of us never make it, but we're desperate to suckle its honey. I don't know, this metaphor is kind of getting away from me. I hope you felt something while watching this video, even a giggle. Did you giggle at least one time? If you didn't, then effing hell, I made some effing diarrhea. Subscribe for more green screen rants. Even though it does 
literally nothing. It's a vanity metric, but I will feel slightly better about myself. So there is that. What, you thought I was just going to end the video?